Hi, everybody. Uh, in this video, I want to do something a little bit different. I'm still interested in what's going on in uh, Chapter 4, Section 3. But this time, instead of trying to write a proof, I want to try to read one. Uh, because reading a proof is a, what you spend a lot of time doing if you're trying to learn higher mathematics. And there's a certain skill to it, which um, is a kind of close reading that, that you don't have to do in many other situations. I mean, reading a little tiny bit of, of mathematics can sometimes take a whole day or week even. Nothing in, hopefully this won't take a week, but we'll see where it gets us. So the, the, I want to walk very carefully through this proof and talk to you about a little bit about how I would go about dealing with making sense of it. So here's the thing I'm interested in. It's from page 122 of the text. And um, the proposition says, if A, B, and C are natural numbers, then the least common multiple of C times A and C times B is C times the least common multiple of AB. So let's not worry about the proof for the moment. We're going to worry about that later. But the main thing to do first, the very first thing to do, is to make sure that you are completely clear about all the terms that are being used so that you can figure out what the proposition says. And in this case, the crucial term that you have to worry about is least common multiple. Because if you don't know what the least common multiple is, you have no hope of figuring out why this proposition is true. So we have a de definition of the least common multiple, and we should check to make sure that we know that it, what, exactly what it is. And I really can't emphasize this enough. You may uh, think you remember the definition of particular terms, but um, if you're dealing with a something that you have to work with in depth, you have to make absolutely sure that you know the definitions and you have them handy and that they're cold. So uh, the definition of least common multiple is uh, least common multiple is a function of two positive integers, and it is the smallest positive integer m such that a divides m and b divides m. So that's great. Let's uh, just to make sure that we are all on the same page, let's look at a few examples of the definition before we even try to deal with the, um, with the theorem. So for instance, suppose a is 2 and b is 3. So then the least common multiple of 2 and 3 is the smallest number, positive integer, such that 2 divides m smallest positive integer m, such that 2 divides m and 3 divides m. So m, 2 divides m, that means m is a multiple of 2. And 3 divides m means that m is a multiple of 3. So we need a number which is both a multiple of 2 and a multiple of 3. And one way to do that is just to multiply 2 times 3 together. So notice that 6 is a multiple of 2 and 3. So it's a candidate to be the least common multiple, but it's only the least common multiple if it's the smallest positive integer that has this property. Um, well, we could just look at the multiples of 2. The multiples of 2 are 2, 4, 6, and so on. And the multiples of 3 are 3, 6, and so on. And sure enough, the first number which occurs in both lists is 6. So 6 is the least common multiple of 2 and 3. Uh, what about the case of, um, I don't know, how about 6 and 8? Suppose A is 6, B is 8. Well, in this case, 48 is a common multiple. One way you can always make a common multiple of two numbers is just to multiply them together. And then it's going to, I mean, if you have a, a, b is always a multiple of a, and it's always a multiple of b. So in this case, 48 is a common multiple. Is it the least common multiple? Well, if you think about this for a minute, uh, it's not the least common multiple because 24 is also a common multiple. So 48 isn't the least common multiple. Maybe 24 is. Um, 
Well, again, we could look at the multiples of these two numbers. The multiples of 8 are 8, 16, 24, and the multiples of 6 are 6, 12, 18, 24. And so sure enough, the, most, the first number that occurs on both lists is 24, and um, so that's the least common multiple. Now, there are lots more sophisticated things you can do with least common multiple, but the main reason I wanted to do these two examples is because they drive home two points. The first is that um, the least common multiple, I mean, you can always make a common multiple by multiple. So if you want to know the least, let me see if I can say this clearly. You're interested in the least common multiple of A and B. It's always less than or equal to A times B, right? Because A times B is a common multiple. And so the least common multiple has to be smaller than every, or equal to every common multiple. And sometimes it's equal and sometimes not equal. And so this gives us a little bit of, of familiarity with working with least common multiples. There's actually a lot more to be said about the least common multiple, but for now, let's just leave it at this. We at least understand what the definition of a least common multiple is. Okay, now let's look at the claim. So I have to remind you what the claim was. The claim was that the if you're given it that the least common multiple of CA times of and CB is C times the least common multiple of A and B. And that's supposed to be true. So it's supposed to be true that the least common multiple of C A and C B is supposed to equal C times the least common multiple of A and B. Well, we did some examples a minute ago. We worked out that the least common multiple of 2 and 3 is 6. So let's pick a C, right? This is supposed to be true for any C. So suppose I take C equals 5. Then the proposition says that the least common multiple of 5 times 2 and 5 times 3 which is the least common multiple of 10 and 15, should equal 5 times the least common multiple of 2 and 3, which is 5 times 6, which is 30. So is the least common multiple of 10 and 15, in fact, 30? Well, 30 is a multiple of 10 and 15. Is it the least common one? Well, we can always do our, uh, our brute force check. The multiples of 10 are 10, 20, 30, and so on. The multiples of 15 are 15, 30, and so on. And so the smallest number that occurs in both lists is in fact 30. So the proposition seems to check out in this case. And the other example we did, we said that the least common multiple of six and eight, was that what we did? Yeah. 6 and 8 was 24. And let's pick C to be 2. So then it should be the case that the least common multiple of 12 and 16 should be 2 times the least common multiple of 6 and 8, which should be 2 times 24, which should be 48. Whoops. Well, 48 is a multiple of 12, and it is a multiple of 16. Is it the least common multiple? Well, we can check. 12, 24, 36, 48, dot, dot, dot. 16, 32, 48, dot, dot, dot. So sure enough, 48 is the least common multiple of 12 and 16. So we've done a couple of examples, and that is not a proof. OK, so some people think, OK, I'm done now because I showed that it worked in a couple of cases. That's no fair because there's a lot of other numbers out there that, that could uh, fail. But at least we understand what it's saying, and it seems plausible based on a couple of examples. So I would never dive into a proof without at least looking at a couple of examples of what's being said to make sure that I actually believe what I'm trying to prove. Now I want to think a little bit more about this definition. Remember that it, it says that um, uh, this that 
the least common multiple m is the smallest positive integer such that a divides m and b divides m. That's part of the definition of being the least common multiple. What does it mean to say something is the smallest? Well, there are two different interpretations, many others, but one, one way to reinterpret the notion of saying that, that uh, something is the smallest is, is let's look at the second thing I've written here. I've written if x is a positive integer so that a divides x and b divides x, then x is bigger than or equal to the least common multiple of a and b. So this is an if-then statement, which is a reinterpretation of the statement, something is the smallest. And, and you see why it works. So by saying that the least common multiple of AB is the smallest number, so that A divides it and B divides it, we're saying that any if you have any number which is a common multiple, then it's bigger than or equal to least common multiple of A and B. So this is a kind of a good thing to bear in mind. Saying that x is the smallest element of a set is equivalent to saying that for all a in a, well, it's the equivalent to saying x is in a and for all a and a, x is less than or equal to a. In other words, you're the smallest element of a set a if you belong to that set, and for any other element of that set, you're less than or equal to it. So that's one reinterpretation. And I've reinterpreted it. I mean, this is the, set, the third thing here is really just completely the same as the second, except I reversed the, I wrote the two terms. I wrote instead of x bigger than or equal to LCM, I wrote it as LCM less than or equal to x. The emphasis there is a little bit different. Whereas here you're saying that any, any other common multiple is bigger than or equal to the least common multiple. Here you're saying the least common multiple is less than or equal to any common multiple. Completely equivalent emphasis maybe is slightly different. So if we need to prove that something is the smallest element of a set, we have to prove that it's in the set because it's supposed to be an element of the set. And then it's enough to show that it's less than or equal to every other element in the set. That's what being the smallest means. Similarly, if we wanted to prove something was the biggest element of a set, we would have to show that it was in the set and it was bigger than or equal to every other element in the set. Okay, the next thing I would do if I was going to try to read this proof is I would read through the proof without worrying about the details to try to get a sense of how it's put together. So let's, let's go back and look at the, the proof from the book. So here's how, the, how it goes. It says, <clears throat> okay, it's going to assume this is kind of my mental dialogue. It's going to assume A, B, and C as an N. Okay, and it's going to give names to the two sides of this inequality, M and N. We will show M equals N. Okay, fine. And now they dive into some work. Uh, they do some calculations. And I notice here that the conclusion of the first paragraph is that M is less than or equal to N. And then I read through the second paragraph, and I see that the second paragraph is that n is less than or equal to m. So the way this proof works, and if you then look at the last sentence, you see what the strategy is in this proof. They're going to show, they're trying to prove that two numbers are equal. Never mind where they came from. m and n, you're just trying to show that they're equal. One way to show that they're equal is to show, first, that m is less than or equal to n, and second, that n is less than or equal to m. Because if those two things are true, it's pretty clear that m is equal to n. So now we have an, a high-level understanding of how the proof is going to be put together. And actually, it's not that uncommon for me to skip to the end of a proof just to get a sense of where they're headed. Because um, it might have been nice for them to have, when they say we will show m equals n, it would have been a favor to the reader for the author to have inserted here by showing First, that m is less than or equal to n, and then 
that m is bigger than or equal to n. If they had put that at the beginning of the proof, that would have been quite informative. And then we would see that these two paragraphs, they could have said, they could have set off these two paragraphs here by saying, first we show, first we consider, we prove m is less than or equal to n. Then we prove m n is less than or equal to m. So because of this style issue where mathematicians sometimes want things to just appear to be a surprise, they, they don't always give you, although it, I think it's good style to help the reader out as much as possible, they don't always do that. So even though so far we have not actually looked at any of the underlying arguments, I think we now have a, a, a sense of why the proof has two paragraphs and what the strategy is going to be. They're going to first try to show that this version, this LCM of CACB is less than or equal to uh, C times LCM of AB, and then they're going to do it the other way around. Okay, now finally, we are ready to start reading the proof. And in that case, what I like to do is to take the proof apart and go line by line and make sure that I understand exactly what each line says. So the first line of the proof is that A, B, and C are natural numbers. So let's just remember they're all positive. That's a good thing to bear in mind in case it worries us later. Now, I already said that we, we, deco we decoded this sentence and we understand that what they're actually going to do is show that M is bigger than or equal to N first or I can't remember actually, m is bigger than or equal to n, then m is less than or equal to n. And we're going to use that to conclude that m equals n. So they could have said that there. We already pointed that out. Okay, they say, by definition, the least common multiple of AB is a positive multiple of both A and B. That's the definition, right? The definition is the least common multiple of A and B is the smallest positive multiple of both A and B. But in particular, it's a positive multiple of both A and B. So the least common multiple of A and B is AX for some X and BY for some Y. That just says that it is a multiple of both A and B. So then they say, from this we see that N, which is C times the least common multiple of AB, equals CAX equals C by Y, BY, is a positive multiple of both CA and CB. Well, that's just a little algebra, right? They took this statement, LCM AB equals AX, and then they took the same uh, sentence, same the second equation, LCM AB equals uh, BY, and then they multiply both sides by C. So another little tip is that you always have a piece of scratch paper by your side while you're reading a proof so you can make all these little scribbles like I'm doing here. So, uh, so far we've not done much except apply the definition and then do some algebra. Then there's this word thus. So they've reached a conclusion. They've said m is less than or equal to n. So why is that true? They've shown that n is a positive multiple of both CA and CB, thus m is less than or equal to n. So this goes back to this comment here that I made about other interpretations of being the smallest or the largest. Remember I said that one way to show that you're the smallest element of a set is, well, that maybe I'll look at this one. If you have a positive integer, which is divisible by both A and B, then you are bigger than or equal to the least common multiple. That's because what we've shown here is that n is a common multiple and uh, sorry of c a and c b and m is the least common multiple so therefore n, which is a common multiple, has to be bigger than or equal to the least common multiple. So now we've got one of our two inequalities. Now we go to the second paragraph. 
We want to prove the inequality the other way around. How do they do that? Well, they say, on the other hand, okay, as M is a multiple of both CA and CB, well, why is that? M is the least common multiple of CA and CB. That was the definition of M. And since it's the least common multiple, it is a common multiple. So M is CAX times CBY for some X and Y in Z. So M is in particular a multiple of C, right? So if we divide M by C, we get that it's a multiple of both A and B. Again, we're just doing algebra. How do we know C isn't zero? Whenever you divide by C, you better make sure C is not equal to zero. Well, remember, I made a little parenthetical remark in my mind at the very beginning that C was in the natural numbers. So it's positive. So we don't have to worry about it being zero. So this is okay. Now, remember what I, that this is the same idea. If you have a common multiple of both A and B, it's got to be bigger than or equal to the least common multiple. So 1 over CM, which is a common multiple, has to be bigger than or equal to the least common multiple. And therefore, when you multiply both sides by C, M has to be bigger than or equal to C times the least common multiple of A and B, which was what we called N. So now we've shown that M is bigger than or equal to N. And that's where the conclusion comes from. Okay, so now we've taken the proof apart, gone line by line through it, and so we see, if, I mean, at least at a micro level, why the proof is true. At this point, the last step, I think, of appreciating a proof like this is to reflect a little bit because you can read a proof and see that the argument works. But then the question you might ask is, what, what lessons, what can you learn from this that might be useful to you in other situations? So this proof is a nice example of a couple things. First of all, the trick that if you want to prove two numbers are equal, you can prove one's bigger than the, or equal to the other and then in the other order. That, that's a kind of a general idea that can be used in lots of situations. And the other thing that we saw here is this use of when you have something which is defined to be the least of a thing, then you can always know that if you have any other of that thing, the thing which is the least is the smallest or equal to. None of that is to say that by sort of one time through this proof, if we now turn the tables on you and said, you have to come up with this proof by yourself, that's a harder step. And it takes more experience with these things and reading lots of them and also getting a real feel for how the least common multiple works to help you put this proof together. So um, I hope this helps. Let me just re recap the, the key ideas. If you're going to look at a proof, then make sure you know the definitions. And by that, I mean, make sure you know them exactly. Write them down. Check them in the book. Make sure you at least understand what the claim is. So it's not just a jumble of symbols, but you have some sense of what it is that you're trying to prove. Sometimes you need to reinterpret the definition. So if I'm asking you to prove that something is a blah, you might have to think of blah from several, several different points of view. Uh, here, the thing that you have to think about from several different points of view in this particular example is what it means to be the least common multiple. Because sometimes one way to find a proof of something is to realize that something that you were thinking about in one way could really be thought about in a different way. Work some examples. I think I maybe skipped over that part, but work some examples to make sure that the statement of the theorem does seem to actually pay, pan out in the cases that you're interested in. Then analyze the structure of the proof. So you, even if the author hasn't told you, like in our case, the author of the proof hasn't told you that they're going to first prove that m is less than or equal to n and then prove that m is bigger than or equal to n. And that's why there's two paragraphs. So analyze the structure by looking at the beginning and the end and trying to get a sense of what the goal is. Uh, and if there's paragraphs, you know, why are there more than one paragraph? What's, this, what's the goal of each paragraph? 
Then finally, go line by line through the proof and make sure that you believe every single step and understand where, uh, if the author seems to think something is true, why it's true. It's good to have a critical eye there too. Here, for example, whenever I see somebody divide in a proof, I ask myself, are they dividing by zero? Are they dividing by zero? Keep an eye open for that as well. And then once you're satisfied that you understand each individual step in the proof, step back and reflect upon the proof as a whole and see if there's any lessons you can learn about other problems that you might have to solve from the way the author attacked this particular problem.